Welcome to the Deep Dive, where we uh, we take a stack of your sources and extract those golden nuggets of knowledge. Today, we're diving headfirst into the world of applied behavior analysis, uh, better known as ABA. And whether you're you know well versed in this field or uh, or just starting to explore it, this deep dive will unpack those key takeaways and hopefully hopefully spark some aha moments along the way. So so let's start with the basics. What exactly is ABA? It's about understanding how behavior works, not just in theory, but in the real world. It's about how we can actually influence behavior in a systematic and measurable way to make a real difference. And to illustrate this, I want to share a story. Picture this, 1949. A young man with profound disabilities, unable to even roll over in bed. Enter Dr. Fuller, armed with nothing but some sugary milk and the principles of ABA. He set out to teach this young man something no one thought possible, to raise his arm. And guess what? It worked. That's a powerful example of how ABA can unlock possibilities. What's fascinating is that Dr. Fuller's study wasn't just about teaching a physical action. It was a pivotal demonstration of how understanding the principles of behavior change can lead to profound results. Absolutely. It speaks to the heart of what ABA is all about. But before we jump into the how, it's important to understand the why. Mm -hmm. And for that, we need to delve into the philosophical roots of ABA, right? Exactly. ABA finds its roots in behaviorism specifically radical behaviorism, a concept you can thank B.F. Skinner for largely shaping. Now, radical behaviorism, unlike some other approaches that focus solely on internal states, like thoughts and feelings, which can be difficult to study and influence directly, views all behavior as a product of the environment. So even those invisible things, like our thoughts and feelings, are considered behaviors influenced by external factors. Precisely. Think of it this way. Your behavior, including your thoughts and emotions, is shaped by the consequences that follow. Say you try a new recipe, and it turns out amazing. The positive feedback, a delicious meal, compliments from family, makes it more likely you'll cook that recipe again. That's your environment influencing your future behavior. Okay, that makes sense. So we've got this foundation of radical behaviorism. But how does it translate into practical application? How do we actually do ABA? Well, back in 1968, three pioneers in the field, Bear, Wolf, and Risley outlined seven core dimensions of ABA. These dimensions set the stage for how ABA is understood and practiced. The first three are pretty straightforward. ABA is applied, meaning it focuses on behaviors that are meaningful in the real world, like communication skills or self-care routines. It's behavioral, meaning we're looking at observable and measurable actions, not just what people say about their behavior. And it's analytic, meaning we're seeking to understand the cause and effect relationship between environment and behavior. Now, where it gets really interesting is with the next dimension, technological. This means that ABA procedures are clear, detailed, and replicable, like a recipe anyone can follow to get the same results. This is crucial because it ensures that ABA interventions can be implemented consistently and effectively across different settings and by different people. And that replicability ties into the next dimension, conceptually systematic. ABA isn't just a random collection of tricks. It's grounded in those fundamental principles of behavior we've been talking about. Every technique, every intervention should be able to be traced back to those core principles. So there's a real science behind it. It's not just about intuition or guesswork. Exactly. And of course, for ABA to be considered effective, it needs to produce meaningful and lasting change. That's the effective dimension. We're talking about real world improvements in people's lives. And lastly, we have generality, which refers to the idea that the positive changes we see should last over time and extend to different environments and situations. It's not enough for someone to only exhibit a desired behavior in a controlled therapy session, for example. We want to see that behavior generalized to their everyday life. Okay, so these seven dimensions really seem to set ABA apart. They provide a framework for understanding not just what ABA is, but how it's implemented effectively and ethically. But I'm curious, how does all of this translate into those aha moments you mentioned earlier? What makes ABA so impactful? That's a great question. And it brings us to the heart of what makes ABA so compelling. It's not just a theoretical framework. It's a practical, optimistic approach to creating positive change. One of the most impactful aspects of ABA is its focus on accountability and transparency, because we're talking about observable behaviors and measurable outcomes. It's not about subjective interpretations. We can track progress, make adjustments based on data, and demonstrate the effectiveness of the interventions we're using. So it takes the guesswork out of it. In a way, yes. Yeah. And because ABA interventions are often rooted in those fundamental principles of behavior, they can be surprisingly straightforward and easy to understand. This means that ABA can be empowering for everyone involved. You're saying that anyone can learn and apply these principles? Exactly. Parents, teachers, 
even individuals themselves can learn to use ABA strategies to create positive changes. It's not about being an expert. It's about understanding those basic principles and applying them consistently. That's really interesting. It challenges the perception that ABA is only something done to people, not with them. Mm. It suggests a more collaborative and empowering approach. Absolutely. And that gets to the heart of why ABA can be so optimistic. It's not about viewing challenges as insurmountable. It's about understanding the power we have to influence behavior and create environments that support growth and well-being. Okay. So we've established that ABA offers this framework, these seven dimensions that guide its application. But where do we actually see ABA making a difference in the real world? What are some concrete examples? Well, early on, a lot of the research and practice of ABA focused on clinical settings, particularly working with individuals with disabilities. And while that's still a significant area of practice, ABA has expanded its reach tremendously. So it's not just about working with individuals with severe disabilities anymore? Not at all. One area where ABA has made incredible strides is in education. Remember those early studies we talked about? The ones that showed how teacher praise could shape student behavior. Right. That was fascinating stuff. Well, that research paved the way for things like positive behavior supports in classrooms, creating more effective and engaging learning environments for all students. So instead of just reacting to problem behaviors, educators are using ABA to prevent those behaviors in the first place. Precisely. And it's not just about managing behavior. It's about teaching those essential social and emotional skills that are crucial for success both in and out of the classroom. And of course, we can't talk about the applications of ABA without mentioning autism. I mean, the progress that's been made in that field is truly remarkable. Absolutely. We've seen how ABA can help individuals with autism develop critical communication skills, build social connections, and gain a greater degree of independence. It's amazing to think about parents working with therapists, mm -hmm. using these principles to unlock their children's potential. It really is. And it highlights a key point about ABA. It's not just about addressing deficits or solving problems. It's about building skills, fostering independence, and ultimately improving quality of life. And that quality of life piece seems to extend beyond traditional settings like classrooms and therapy rooms. I mean, I've been hearing more and more about ABA popping up in some unexpected places. That's right. We're seeing ABA being applied in areas like healthcare, business, even environmental conservation. Seriously, environmental conservation? How does that even work? Well, think about it. A lot of environmental problems stem from human behavior, right? That's true. So by understanding the principles of behavior change, we can develop strategies to promote things like recycling, reduce energy consumption, and encourage sustainable practices. So from teaching a child with autism to communicate to promoting sustainability, ABA really does have its hands in everything. It does. And it all comes back to those fundamental principles we've been discussing. When we understand how behavior works, how the environment influences our actions, we can start to create systems and strategies that promote positive change. It sounds incredibly powerful. But like any powerful tool, I imagine there's potential for misuse. It's like, uh, it's like we always say, with great power comes great responsibility. Exactly. And that's uh, that's something that ethical practitioners take very seriously because ABA is about understanding and influencing behavior. It's uh, it's crucial to acknowledge that this knowledge can be misapplied. So how do we ensure ABA is used ethically and responsibly? Mm. What are the safeguards in place? For starters, we have professional organizations like the Behavior Analyst Certification Board or BACB that establish ethical guidelines for practitioners. These guidelines emphasize things like informed consent, prioritizing the well-being of the individual, and avoiding conflicts of interest. So a framework for ethical practice, that makes sense. But it's not just about rules on paper, right? It's about mm -hmm. the people applying those principles in their work. Precisely. Ethical ABA requires more than just knowledge. It demands a deep understanding of the underlying principles of behaviorism, a commitment to using evidence-based practices, and a genuine desire to improve lives. It's about approaching this work with humility, recognizing the potential impact of our actions. It sounds like a lot of responsibility rests on the shoulders of practitioners. It's a responsibility we take seriously. And it's one reason why ongoing dialogue and critical reflection within the field are so important. Because ABA, like any field of study, isn't immune to critique. In fact, engaging with those criticisms is essential for its evolution and growth. So let's talk about those criticisms. What are some of the main concerns that have been raised about ABA? Some criticisms stem from misunderstandings of its core principles. 
people hear behavior modification, and they might imagine some kind of dystopian future where free will is stifled. But as we've discussed, radical behaviorism acknowledges the role of the environment on all behavior, including our thoughts and feelings. It's not about control. It's about influence and understanding those influences to bring about positive change. It's about working with individuals, not imposing change upon them. Exactly. And that focus on collaboration and respect is something that's central to ethical ABA practice today. You've touched on how important it is for ABA to evolve and adapt. What does that look like moving forward? What are some of the key areas of growth for the field? One crucial area is broadening our perspective to consider the larger social context. While ABA has historically focused on individual behavior, there's a growing awareness that we can't ignore the systemic factors that contribute to behaviors. So taking a more holistic approach, yeah. recognizing that individual behavior doesn't exist in a vacuum. Exactly. For instance, if a student is struggling in school due to factors outside their control, like poverty or a lack of resources at home, simply addressing their classroom behavior is unlikely to be effective. It's about addressing the root causes, not just the symptoms. Precisely. That's why it's vital for behavior analysts to collaborate with other professionals educators, social workers, policymakers, to advocate for systemic changes that create more equitable and supportive environments for everyone. It sounds like ABA is at a pivotal point. There's this incredible potential for positive impact, but also a need to acknowledge its history, address criticisms, and adapt to a changing world. You've hit the nail on the head. For ABA to thrive, we need to embrace those critical conversations, listen to diverse voices and perspectives, and be open to new ways of thinking. Because ultimately, it's not about defending a particular method. It's about improving lives. Well said. We've covered a lot of ground in this deep dive into the world of ABA. We've talked about its philosophical underpinnings, its core principles, its successes, and its challenges. But I think the biggest takeaway, the one I hope you'll carry with you, is that ABA, at its heart, is about understanding the power of the environment to shape behavior and using that knowledge to create positive, lasting change. And that the journey of understanding ABA is ongoing, always evolving. So as you navigate your day, I encourage you to view your own interactions, your own environments. Through that ABA lens, how might a deeper understanding of behavior change influence the way you interact with the world around you? Something to ponder. Until next time, keep diving deep.